Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Y'all give them a hand. Amen. Well, how are you this morning? You, you know, there's a debate going on. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, that... Um, the decade has not started or the decade hasn't ended. Have y'all heard about this? That we're, you know, that we just passed a decade and somebody goes, no, 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 decade doesn't end till the end of 2020. I'm like, really? That, yeah, it doesn't, it, it's, we're still in last day. I'm like, it's crazy. Because here's what I think. I think it's a new decade. Can I just go with that? Amen? Yeah. So it's a new decade. So uh, with that, it's also a new year. And so we've been asked this question last week. We were in Romans chapter 8. If you remember, if you were here last week, if you missed it, you can go back and, and look at it again. But we asked the question, what is the best thing you could bring to the table in 2000 or 2020, man, I almost said 2002. It's just hard to even say 2020, but uh, what's the best thing you could bring to the table? And we talked about last week about the greatest thing you could bring to the table, the greatest thing you could bring into the new year is a life controlled by the Spirit. If you remember last week, we talked in Romans chapter 8 that the life controlled by the Spirit leads to life and peace, and the life that controlled by the flesh leads to death. And so Paul was very straightforward in that passage as he talked about in Romans chapter 8, he was talking talking about who owns you, who or what owns you, because the truth is something or someone owns you, right? right. You go back to chapter seven and, and Paul was talking about uh, the struggle of sin and he was talking about the things he doesn't want to do and the things he does and the things he keeps on doing and when he wants to do right, he can't. And I love the fact that he comes out of that conversation in the very first verse of Romans chapter eight, he says, look, if you struggle, Therefore, there is no condemnation. In other words, I don't want you to keep struggling, right? I don't want you to continue struggling with the same sin. But if you're struggling with that, then understand there's no condemnation. And then he goes into who owns you. And he begins to explain to the Romans and, the, and to, the, the, to us even today, and he begins this contrast of back and forth, if we talked about last week, of life in the spirit, life in the flesh, life in the spirit, life in the flesh. And he goes back and forth over and over again, because here's what Paul's wanting you to do. Paul's wanting you to move on, because some of the things you, some of you guys are struggling with, and some of the things that, that the church is struggling with, they've been struggling with for 30 years. That's not a struggle, that's a habit. Amen? That's moved beyond the struggle. And if you're still struggling from the things you struggled with in ninth grade, okay, and you're 35, 24, 21, wherever you follow yourself, that's not a struggle. That's become a part of your life. And that's why Paul was explaining to these guys, look, man, if you want to live in life in peace and you want to fill that bucket up, then live your life according to the Spirit, or more literally, the mind possessed by the Spirit. In other words, that's all you think about. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8. He's saying all this thing of life and peace being possessed, the mind possessed by the Spirit, is controlled or dominated. And so when Paul said, hey, the mind that's dominated by the Spirit leads to life and peace, what he's showing is, is look, you may be struggling over here in chapter seven. Don't condemn yourself because you're not condemned because what Jesus did on the cross has set you free, right? And so he says, look, what should be in you and what you should be experiencing when your life is focused on the spirit is life and peace, which literally means a state of acceptance in regard to your pardon, 
that you are no longer living under the consequences of sin, that you're no longer a slave to your sin. You've been said, now you still are gonna struggle with sin, I get that, but you're no longer a slave. In other words, here's what we said last week, you have a choice. Isn't that crazy? You have a choice. I know that's astonishing for some of you. You actually have a choice to be pure. You have a choice to do what you do with your money. You have a choice to do what you do with your time. And so we've been talking about this. A couple weeks ago, I drew this. It's interesting because as we think about the bucket, you know, life tends to drain you, doesn't it? Anybody been drained over the holidays? I mean, to be honest, right? And, and so we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and, and I just kind of want to come back to this because we all understand that God wants us to be spiritual, right? He wants us to be spiritually mature. And so what happens is we come to church every week and we come and we sit in this place every week and we talk about the things of God and our knowledge grows. But what do we do with it, right? Because see, I think God also wants us to be emotionally mature. And then also physically mature. Here, here's what happens though for many of us. For many of us, we come to church every week and we live in Romans chapter seven and we gain all this knowledge, but we don't do anything with it. We don't do anything with it. And so physically, we're not in shape because we worry and we have all these things going on in our journey and that, and emotionally, we're a mess, amen? So the only way that we don't divorce our spiritual maturity from our physical and emotional maturity is this word right here. Obedience. See, at some point, the struggle turns into the habit. And the only way for us to grow physically, because see, our spiritual state also affects our spiritual, our spirit, physically, our spiritual state also affects our emotional state. And if this isn't healthy and this isn't healthy, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have of the holy. Some of you are so stinking, you've memorized whole books of the Bible. And yet there's some who go, come into church every week, they hear the truth, they do, and they're going, oh yeah, amen, bless you, pastor, that's so good, amen. And they go out and they're a physical mess and they're an emotional mess. Well, that's not maturity. So the only way to bring those three things in line is through obedience. And that's where Paul was bringing us over from the struggle to the identity of who owns you. It's through Christ Jesus. And so if we've been set free, right? If we're no longer a slave to sin, if we're no longer have to do what sin does, then what's our response? What's our response? As we said last week, the greatest thing we could bring into this new year, this life, our, our bucket, the thing that we could fill up in our life. And, and if, if that's the greatest thing we could bring is filled with life and peace, then our response is we're going to go to church, right? Or how about this? I, my response, Lord, is I'm not going to cuss or I'm not going to drink too much, right? I mean, that's, that's our response. I won't steal, I won't cheat, I won't be greedy. Or is there something else? Is there something else it should be our response as we think about what Jesus has set us free from. And today, I want to talk about what should be in our bucket. As we talked last week that life and peace is in that bucket and life and peace comes out. But I think there's something else of a response that, that, that's in our bucket. And it's this thing called gratitude. It's this thing called gratitude. And, and I want to challenge you today. Believer or not, whether you believe in what Jesus says or not, is to walk out of this place today, maybe filled up this morning and maybe practicing in 2020 something you've never practiced before. You see, here's what I notice about people and especially around the holidays, but now even after the holidays, there's just a whole lot of people that very honestly, if you look at their faces, their body language, uh, they're, they're just unhappy. You ever notice that? I mean, drive around your car, you look at people at red lights because I like to look at people at red lights and stare at them, you know, because then they look at you and you're like, 
You know, looking down and looking away and all that. And you see that and you see them walking through the grocery store, the malls, and you see their face. They look tired. They look worn out. They look bored. They're drained of any emotion. You go to church and you see people and it's kind of like that fake smile. Yeah, it's not real, and, and it's just it's just odd, you know, that, that people do this. Danielle and I went to White House yesterday to pick up some furniture, and we stopped at the Golden Honey McDonald's on our way home, and um, as we went in there, some of you will get that in a minute, but anyway, uh, as, as we went in there, we, we were interacting with the employees and interacting with the people there, and we sat at this table there, and, and Danielle and I both commented, these are the friendliest people we've ever run into, and that's so odd at McDonald's, Amen. Because it's hard to find people, really happy people. Because the older you get, we know that life gets serious, doesn't it? The older we get, we have taxes, we have a house payment, we have politics, and let's don't even go there. Careers, kids, right? College funds. Uh, lately, over the last couple, about four weeks, I've made a habit of smiling at people wherever I go. And you want to get some really crazy looks. I'm telling you, I was in uh, Academy last week, bought a couple new fishing rods. And um, I, I was so excited because they were cheap. But anyway, I, everybody I went past, I smiled at it. Man, woman, child, whatever. I just walk around. <laughs> dude, you want to scare people, you know? And you look like this and you walk around smiling. It's like, dude, there's a creeper, you know? But I mean, it was just... I, I just, I've literally spent the whole month just smiling at people. And it's the oddest thing. People don't know what to do. I was checking out at the academy. This little girl was checking me out. And, and I looked at her. It's on New Year's Day that my brother and I were there. And, and I just looked at her and I said, hey, thank you for working. And she went, what? I said, thank you for working. She goes, dude, I need the money. You don't thank me, amen? I remember those days. You see, the interesting thing is gratitude is from the same word as the word grace. It's amazing that, I find that interesting that a person who has begun to accept how gracious God is, all of a sudden becomes a grateful person. When we realize what God has set us free from, when we realize we're no longer controlled by, the, by, by sin, that we actually have a choice then we understand that word, that interesting thing, that gratitude comes from that same word as grace. And we accept how gracious God is. All of a sudden, we become grateful. And so to think accurately is to thank God continuously in the midst of life, whether it's good or bad. You see, gratitude is rarely expressed. I'm finding that out more and more that gratitude is rarely expressed. In fact, we know as parents that gratitude is important because if you have a small child and, and someone walks up to that small child and hands them a piece of candy, what do we say as parents immediately? What do you say, right? Because we know that something needs to be done when a child receives something, right? And we know that there's something that needs to be connected and it can't just stay out there. And so that child is looking at you and, and, and they're looking at the dude that gave him candy and he's like, I don't know. What do you say? Thank you. Thank you. See, we know that, don't we? But how many times do we express that? You see, gratitude is felt by the one expressing it and the one receiving it. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Because gratitude is felt by the one expressing it and the one that's receiving it. And there's this great story in the New Testament that Jesus tells, talks about in Luke chapter 17. You've probably heard about it. And, and it's, it's this great little story. And I kind of want to connect that this morning to gratitude because Jesus starts his story. In fact, it says in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, it says that while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, uh, there's a northern part where Galilee is and there's a southern part of Israel. And so when Jesus had to move down to Jerusalem, he had to move through this area of Samaria. And Samaria was, they were still Jews, but they were kind of this different set of Jews. They weren't like the real Jews, but they had their own customs. They had their own stuff going on. And so they, they, they were like this defunct group. And, uh, and so Jesus had to go through there. And so he's passing through Samaria. If you're going to go from the north to the south, you had to pass through that. And honestly, Jews from the south and the north didn't really 
really like the Sumerians in the middle. So there's this kind of conflict going on, this, this uh, almost kind of a racism going on there in Jesus' day. And so Jesus is passing on. And in verse 12, it says, as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. Now, in the New Testament, the leprosy was considered almost a judgment of God. And so I remember I went over to Hawaii a few years ago and they, they, we were on this one island that had a leper colony. And they don't really have those anymore because we figured out that leprosy has been cured now and we know that. But back in the day, they didn't want to be around leprosy and leprosy can be uh, transmitted by contact. And so in, in Jesus' day, they would move the lepers out and they had to move out of town into their own area away from them and away from anybody else because they couldn't be touched. They couldn't be around. And it was almost like they were being judged by God. And so if you had leprosy in Jesus' day, it was like God was mad at you, right? And so you have these 10 lepers are coming along. It says, as he entered the village, he was met by 10 le lepers who stood at a distance. And this is very interesting because Jesus is about to enter the city. These guys can't come into the city. And so I love this next statement. It says, and they raised their voices and Jesus, they yelled at him, have mercy on us. And here's where it's so interesting. I find this so interesting that Jesus does what he does because when he saw them, he said to them, he, in other words, he yelled back at them. Jesus yelled back at them. I mean, don't miss the scene here, okay? Because sometimes we think the lepers walked up to Jesus and Jesus was wearing his white robe and all that. No, 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 you, you gotta get the picture here. These guys are yelling at Jesus. Jesus doesn't even go over to them. He just yells back at them. Have mercy on us. Jesus looks back at him. Go and show yourselves to the priest. And they went, huh? Go and show yourself to the priest. What did he say about feast? Go show yourself to the priest. See, here's what you may not know that they knew in this. Because see, in Jesus' day, if you had leprosy and you were cast out, the only way you could come back into the community is actually go show yourself to the priest. And the priest would do whatever they did. I don't know how they did that. I don't know what they did. But the priest would then look at them and go, yep, you know what? You're healed. Now you can go back and you can interact. And once the priest kind of signs off on that, you know, it, it's, it's this big deal. So Jesus yells back to these 10 lepers, you go back to the priest. Now, we don't know where the priest was. If the priest was in Jerusalem, that was a couple of days away. We don't know if the priest was in town. We don't know if priest was two hours away, three hours away, four hours away. But what's interesting in the story is that when Jesus said, hey, go show yourself to the priest, it says, and as they went. In other words, they just went. They just turned and started walking. Can you imagine 10 guys with leprosy that sort of went? We don't know if they were healed immediately, but here's what the text says. As they went, they were miraculously healed and made clean. Now, again, we don't know if that was a two-day trip, a six-hour trip, a two-hour trip. We don't know if they went, had, there was a priest in the area. But all we know is, is as these guys went, something miraculous happened. It was an incredible story. Huh. And then verse 15. Because they, they, they get into, they go to the priest and they're on the way to the priest. But before they get there, it says one of them in verse 15, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back. We don't know how far they were. They don't know if they were all the way to the priest. They were all the way back to Jerusalem. They don't know where they were. But at some point, this guy looks down and goes, holy cow. Can you imagine all 10 of them looking at themselves? Going, Dude, this is awesome. One of them turned back, glorifying and praising and honoring God with a loud voice. And he lay face downward at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over. And Luke, this, so we don't miss this, and he was a Samaritan. The details involved. It's an incredible story. Can you imagine Jesus? I mean, Jesus could have very easily healed those guys right there. Instead, he sent them to the priest. And, and it's not enough that one showed up to the priest because the priest had heard about this Jesus and they, and they come there and they said, look, man, we got healed. And, and the priests were looking at them going, guys, how did this happen? And what happened? We don't know. We yelled at a guy. He yelled back at us. We're here. And now it's gone. And, and can you imagine the power that's going on there and the things that are happening there? But this one guy didn't go to the priest. He came back. He came back to Jesus the rest of the guys, they'd been set free. Can you imagine how awesome that was? They had been in the leprosy college. They had been separated from their family, hadn't seen their uncles, hadn't seen their aunts, hadn't, maybe hadn't seen their kids, hadn't seen their wife, hadn't seen any of their family over the time. And all of a sudden now they could go back and be with their family. I mean, this is an incredible scene that these guys were a part of. 
And then this whole idea of gratitude comes in. Because I want you to see this, because in verse 17, then Jesus asked a question. You ready for this? You ready? Everybody say ready. ready. It says this, we're not 10 of you cleansed? I almost think Jesus had kind of a grin on his face. I, I read one guy who was talking about this passage, a theologian, and, and he, he was saying Jesus had tears rolling down his face. And I just don't think Jesus was, had tears on his face here. I think Jesus was being a little bit facetious with these guys. Hey guys, weren't, weren't there 10 of y'all? I mean, weren't, weren't there 10 of you? And didn't I, didn't I do enough? I mean, did I have enough power to heal all of you? I mean, there's only one of you. Come on guys, I mean, wasn't there 10? And then he asked a question. Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? See, gratitude was a big thing for Jesus because he was asking where those other nine guys went. Verse 18, was there no one found to return and give thanks and praise God except this foreigner? Was there only one? Was my power not enough for the other nine? What, did, did, I, did I not get enough? I thought I did. Maybe, maybe I need to yell a little louder. Maybe I need to get a little closer. Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? You see, gratitude is a big thing. It was a big thing to Jesus. And Jesus was asking, hey guys, where, didn't I heal all of you? I sent all 10 to the priest and a big overwhelming thing going on. The priest, only one could come back. See, gratitude isn't just an emotion, it's relational. Gratitude is relational in our journey. It's not enough to feel gratitude. You have to express gratitude. Right. See, many of you in this room, you're grateful. But you're grateful on the inside and you never express that on the outside. You see, gratitude is felt by the one expressing it and the one receiving it. And, and, and here's the statement that jumped off the page for me this last week. And I remember it was Monday morning. I was out, I, I was exercising, I was, I was on the treadmill and I heard this statement and here's this statement that got my attention. Unexpressed gratitude is not, or unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. Let me say that again. Unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. It's not a neutral thing. When we don't express gratitude, we are actually making a withdrawal from someone. Because the person not experiencing gratitude feels it, right? It's actually experienced as rejection. Think about it. Why should I be grateful? See, unexpressed gratitude is actually experienced as rejection because that person has given you and you didn't give back. And so what they feel is rejection. Well, it's just my mom. Come on, dude. I don't need to thank my mom. She's supposed to wash the dishes. She's supposed to do the clothes, right? It's just my mom, man. Have you thanked him? Why should I thank him? That's what I pay him to do. I don't need to thank him for that, right? I mean, think about that. Well, you're supposed to support your family. Why should I thank him? Why should I thank her? You see, it's felt as rejection because over time, unexpressed gratitude begins to feel like rejection. And this is big because even if you don't believe in Jesus, you know this. Even if you don't know how God created us, this is true. But here's what I believe is God created us this way is that all of our hearts, and listen to this, all of our hearts gravitate towards acceptance. There is something in every one of us that we gravitate towards acceptance. That's why social media is such a huge thing of you being on Snapchat, being on uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that. And you post a picture and you go back and you look for those likes. You're looking for those comments. You're looking for those things. I'm still guilty of it. And I don't even have Facebook where I'll get on Summit Heights Facebook and I'll look at who's watching the sermon, who didn't watch the sermon. Did anybody comment? I'm still worrying about it because there's something in of us, our hearts gravitate towards acceptance acceptance, and also our hearts are repelled by rejection. You see, there's something in us, and we know that. Whether you believe in God or not, whether you're watching and you know there's a God, but you're listening in because you're wondering if it could be real, is that in every one of us, our hearts gravitate towards acceptance, and, and our hearts are repelled by, by rejection. You see, ingratitude is a subtle form of rejection, which means this, that you can ingratitude someone right out of your house. Think about that. That's why your first marriage ended. 
is you ingratituded him right out of the house. You ingratituded her right out of the house. You can ingratitude yourself right out of someone's heart. You can ingratitude to someone, someone's, uh, yourself out of their heart. You can ingratitude a kid out of your home. You can ingratitude the person you say you love the most by ingratitude. You see, gratitude's huge. You know, I bet if you'd have gone and tracked down those other nine lepers, see, we don't have anything in, this, in the text about that. And then you've asked those guys and you track them down and, and you begin to ask them the question, hey guys, hey guys, guys, guys time out, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Are, are you grateful for what happened to you? You know what those guys would probably say? Well, heck yeah, we are. Man, I got my life back. Man, this is awesome. I bet they were singing. I bet they went to church. I bet they were going, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, they were, I bet these guys were absolutely undone. The problem is unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. Because Jesus asked, were there not 10 of you and only one came back? And only one came back? You see, Jesus is expressing to us and teaching us in this principle that our lives, our bucket, that, that thing we bring into the, the journey is, is, is in response to life and peace and us being set free. We no longer have to struggle. We still struggle, but we don't have to be owned by sin is that our response is gratitude. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Jesus. Those, those lepers would not have got to go home and see their mama to go home and worship again if it wasn't for Jesus. It wasn't that they weren't grateful. They just didn't express it. They didn't talk about it. See, it's hard to maintain, isn't it? It's hard to maintain. In fact, Colossians 4.2, Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. To be grateful. See, I think there are five great enemies of gratitude. And I want to give them to you real quick. Look at them. Number one, here's why some of us are not grateful is because we always are comparing ourselves to others. We're always comparing ourselves. It's hard to be grateful when you're comparing yourself. There's this parable in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 15, where we won't read it all, but it's about this uh, employer who was hiring these employees, and they came in. There was a group that came in in the early day, some that came in the mid-afternoon, some that came one hour before, and when it came time to get paid, because you got paid on the day you worked, and that story is that when it came time to get paid, he started paying them, and, and all the guys noticed that, that the guys who showed up at 1 o'clock got paid as the same as the guys that showed up at 8 o'clock, the guys that showed up at four o'clock got paid as the same as the guy that showed up at one o'clock and the guys that showed up at eight o'clock and all of a sudden this argument breaks out and going, well, that's not fair. You ever said that? That's not fair. <laughs> so he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired to last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Are you envious because I'm generous? You see, the reason some of us are not grateful is because we're always looking across the fence. We're always looking at someone else's journey. Here's the second one, entitlement. One reason we struggle with gratitude is because God isn't working the way we want or we expect him to. We have a certain expectation that God needs to jump when we say jump, that I deserve this. And often God's will unfolds very differently than we expect and we miss what he's doing in our life because we felt entitled to something that God said, I got something so much better for you. But we're still stuck back here thinking we deserve this or we deserve that relationship or we deserve that car, that house, that granite, that stainless, whatever. And we get stuck and we're no longer grateful. Here's the third one, pride. Pride. In Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 17, Moses says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you to this day. Otherwise, if you forget it, because you're gonna be blessed when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down. There's nobody in here, right? And when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increases and all you have is multiplied, He says, then your heart will become proud. Well, I I deserve this. Well, I worked hard for this, right? The economy is doing so well. I mean, this has nothing. See, 
He says, you'll become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. In other words, set you free. Go back to Romans 7, beginning in Romans 8. You've been set free. You'll forget the reason you're blessed has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the fact that he has blessed you and set you free. Now we have a responsibility to be obedient. We have a responsibility to not only gain spiritual knowledge, but then let that affect our emotional and our physical life. But don't forget where it comes from. And pride will keep you from being grateful. Here's the fourth thing, bitterness. I think that's why Paul said, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander in Ephesians 4, along with every form of malice. And then he says this, be kind and compassionate to one another. Why? Forgiving each other. Why? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Don't get better. Don't get better. See, the reason some of you are not grateful is you're still ticked off. It's about something that happened 10 years ago. Danielle and I were talking last night and we were talking about different families that have come into Summit and, and, and got mad and broke up, right? Because that's what happens when people leave, they break up with us. And, and, and how, that, how that hurts and how those things that we were talking about last night and, and some families we couldn't remember and some families we were, we were thinking about going, now, now what happened? Because see, if we're not careful, we'll get stuck yeah. in bitterness, Based on something that happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And all of a sudden, gratitude's nowhere a part of our life. And the last one, number five, is spiritual myopia. And that's basically being short-sighted. You know, it's not hard to get there, is it? Think about Elijah in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 19. After he had come and he had defeated all the Baal gods and Jezebel was chasing him across the desert saying the same thing happened to him is going to happen to you. And Elijah runs into a cave and over and over again, he says, oh God, I'm the only one left. Oh God, what are you going to do? You ever whined? Come on. Well, let me ask it another, no, let me ask that another way. Anybody ever been 13? Amen? Okay, then you understand. It's not fair. I can't roll wide. And so Elijah's having this 13-year-old moment. Now, if you're 13, don't get mad at me, okay? I'm just saying, you'll grow out of that too, all right? And so it's this idea that he's, he's whining. I'm unique. No one's ever done this or gone through this. See, and what, he, what, what was happening is he was missing what God was doing. He could not see what God was about to do because he was stuck in that moment. One might say that he had succumbed to victimhood. You ever been a victim? And your whole life is based on victim. When I was selling cars uh, about 22 years ago, I, I remember this guy named Rick White came in and, and he, he worked for my dad out at Crosby Liebus. And it was the very first customer I had that, that I actually had a connection to. And he worked with dad. And, and so when he came to see me, man, I was, I was amped up because I, I got to do this right because he's going to go back out and talk to my dad. And I want to make my dad proud and all this stuff going on. And he bought a $36,000 Pathfinder. That's cheap nowadays. But back then, that was a bunch of money. And so he picked it out. He had it for his wife, all that. We were going to get it detailed. And I remember we, I took it back to the guys to wash it and get it all cleaned up because he was coming to get it that afternoon. And they called me back to the back and said, Ed, we got a problem. So I went back to the back and they took me back to Rick's Pathfinder and they took me around the passenger side door. And one of the wash rack guys had this buffer that he decided a brand new car needed to be buffed. No, but he did it anyway. And what he did was is he burned the paint off the door about that long and about that wide. And I was like, oh crap. That's, all, that's the only thing that came to my mind. And Rick's coming to get it. So I called, I went, ran up front, I called Rick real quick and I said, Rick, we got a problem. And he's like, well, what's up, dude? And I, I mean, I was panicking because again, he works for my dad. He's gonna be talking to me about my dad. I wanted to make my dad proud. I'm so grateful for what my dad had done for me and done all this. And so I wanted to make sure that Rick was treated well, that nothing went wrong. And now the whole thing's falling apart and I felt all that's going on. And I thought, oh man, dad's gonna be disappointed. I mean, I had gone to this place. Dad's gonna be disappointed with me. And now I'm a failure. I can't sell a car. I just sold the car. I can't sell cars. I mean, all this stuff. You ever, been, you ever been there? And I'll never forget what Rick said to me. Ed, Ed, chill out, bro. If that's the worst thing that happens, we're going to be all right, son. And in that moment, my 
myopia, short-sightedness. I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. He said, son, get it painted. Call me when it's done. I said, we all right. It's just a car. You see, sometimes for us, we don't express gratitude is because we can't see. We've already convinced ourselves that we're the victim and can't be fixed and it won't be fixed. I remember when Joseph was talking to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done by saving many lives. I mean, what if Joseph would have got into that victimhood mode? See, what you thought was gonna destroy you, God's gonna use. God's gonna use. Now again, I'm gonna go back to Romans chapter seven because I I think this needs to be said. Because some of you think, well, God's gonna use my sin. No, 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 no. Because there's a thing called obedience. And here's what God's gonna use in your journey is when you're obedient and still things happen to you and you still struggle, and here's what he's gonna do. He's gonna work those, go back and read Romans 8, 28, for all things. He's talking about all things. He's talking about even in the struggle, that all things I'm gonna work out. I'm gonna work out. And see, some of us have forgotten that, and that's where that gratitude has just gone out the door. See, if you track down those nine lepers, if you track those guys down, they would have been praising God. They just never expressed it. They never got to that place. You see, unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. It was important to Jesus because he asked where they were. It's emotional, it's relational. See, if your bucket is not full of gratitude, that means you're not expressing it. That we are bringing it out. And if you're not careful, bitterness, comparison and pride and entitlement and short-sightedness will set in. So here's what I wanna do, I wanna close this morning with a couple of questions for you. And maybe this year, maybe 2020 would look totally different for us. And see, I think many of us, we, we have all the spiritual knowledge we could possibly have. But we're not emotionally mature and we're not physically mature because it comes down to this relational thing. And before I do, let me say this, because I, I know some of you are probably sitting there going, you know, Ed, you're right. I need to be more grateful and I really do need to thank, thank them. And, and she's probably sitting beside you or he's sitting beside you and you've never thanked him. I remember the first time I came home and we sat around the table and this was probably 10 years ago I, when, before Springer was born and we were sitting around the table and dinner was there and Danielle looked up and she goes, honey, I am so grateful to you that you went to work today. Kids, would you tell your dad how grateful you are? And so the kids, I mean, they, she coached them all day. And so the kids started praising me and I'm sitting at the end of the table going how much did you spend (laughs) right it's a car wreck you know I'm looking out the window looking for a dent see we know that gratitude is important don't we and I know what some of you are thinking because I would be thinking the same thing if I was sitting out there going number one I don't know you that well bro I know you're our pastor and I know we talk and we have five all that but we really don't like to be told to do something right And so some of you are thinking, man, if I leave this sermon today, I leave this church today and I go home and I thank my family, they're gonna look at me and go, the only reason you're doing that is because he preached that sermon, right? Because that's what I'd be thinking. And so some of you right now, you're gonna wait. You're gonna wait two weeks because you don't like being told what to do and you don't wanna be accused of that. And you're gonna wait two weeks and then you're gonna make them think it's your idea, right? They know you, okay? They know it's not your idea. So don't wait two weeks, okay? If you wait two weeks, they know you, it's not your idea. For some of you, you just need to own it and go, you know what, Ed talked about it, I heard it today, he's right. I haven't said, I haven't expressed. I just wanna say thank you. Let me tell you something. Look look at me, guys. Look at me, ladies. I know you're hearing me say that today, but it's gonna mean something if you'll just own it. You'll just own it. So here's two questions I wanna leave you with today. 
Because I bet if you went and found those nine lepers, they'd go, oh yeah, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be where I am today and all that. And that one leper and he went back and he traveled and he had to go back and he had to praise God and he expressed it and, and all those things. And, and so here's two questions. Number one, who do you owe a debt of gratitude to? And so here's what I wanna ask you to do, okay? I, I do this almost every week. I write two handwritten letters. And we have a philosophy around Summit Heights. We wanna find somebody doing something well and we wanna celebrate that. And so we'll write them a letter and that's anywhere from giving money to time to service or whatever. Some of you've received letters from me, handwritten cards on that. And so here's what I wanna challenge you to do. Who do you owe a debt of gratitude this week? And I want you to find a couple of people and I want you to hand write them a letter, okay? Here's the second one. Who do you owe a debt of gratitude that has helped you get where you are today? Who is it in your journey that has helped you get to where you are? I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Jerry Pipes. That's, that's a name. He now works for Louisiana College down in Pineville, Louisiana. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Dick Stagner, who is now in heaven. Both those men I've written letters to both those men before Dickie died and, and, and even Jerry, even as Jerry and I still talk today, there's a constant reminder. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you guys. I actually got a guy this week as I was studying this and I was looking at these questions who used to go to Summit Heights and now they don't attend here that I need to go back to him because if it wasn't for him, he sat at that table. That table out at Rhonda and Alan Sanders' house where they interviewed me and he sat at that table. And then when our church went through some really difficult seasons and I sat in his living room and I shared everything with him, I'll never forget what he said. He said, is that all you've got? Is that all you've got? Dude, come on, let's go do church together. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. So, so two questions for you today. As we go into 2020, and I don't have any fancy saying that 2020 and all this stuff and 2020 vision year. You know what? It's the same as 2019, it's 2020. Are you gonna be obedient and are you gonna be grateful? I mean, what would happen if all of a sudden we became like the one leper and just begun to be grateful? So, so I'll close with this story and then we're gonna take communion and we'll worship out. Last night we were laying in bed. Daniel and I worked like rented meals yesterday went and got this desk and set it up at the house and, and worked all day long. We started doing spring cleaning on January, right? And so that's always like making one smoke and drink. And so uh, uh, if you don't, and, and so, uh, it, you know, we, we were in there and last night we were laying in bed and I, I told her, I said, thank you for hanging out with me today. She goes, what do you mean? I said, I really enjoyed working with you. She went, huh? I was like, I said, I really enjoyed it. She goes, you know, I really enjoyed it too. And so we laid in bed last night and we, we just started exchanging gratitude. And it's amazing how that changes your outlook. So two questions. Who do you owe a debt of gratitude to? And who do you need to write this week just to say I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you? I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you. Don't text them, okay? Hey, thank you, bro. That, 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 that didn't count, okay? Sit down and write a letter. You can write three sentences, amen? I know. And just thank them. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you. Because unexpressed gratitude comes across as ingratitude. And you can ingratitude people right out of your life. Amen? Amen? Well, y'all got quiet there at the end. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for those 10 guys, for that one. God, thank you for Jesus that that one came back to and fell at his feet and worshiped him over and over and over again. God, may we be those people as catchy as it is, 2020, 2020 vision, all this stuff. God, it, I pray that if we don't do anything else this year, that we would be people of gratitude. That as our buckets drain, as, as we are 
poured out, as Paul talked about last week, that the, the flow would be gratitude towards each other and towards you. So Lord, I love you. Thank you today for your word. May it change us and mold us. And we ask it all in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.